All right, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute here at WSU. And on behalf of the Institute, let me welcome you out to our event today, which features Eric Grunendijk, uh, who is the Dunavant, am I, am I saying that right? Mm -hmm. The Dunavant professor? The Dunavant professor of political science at the University of Memphis. He received his PhD from the University of Michigan in 2009. He currently serves as the president of the political psychology section of the American Political Science Association and sits on the governing council of the International Society for Political Psychology. His research has been published in numerous scholarly journals, including some of the top uh, journals in political science, such as the American Journal of Political Science and the Journal of Politics. His book, Competing Motives in, Par in the Partisan Mind, was published by Oxford University Press in 2013, and it received an honorable mention from the American Political Science Association for the best book published in political psychology that year. He's going to be talking today uh, about something that's very timely and topical given the uh, elections and what's happening in, some, in the elections, and that is election norms and democracy. So join me now in welcoming Eric Grunendike to WSU. Well, thank you, Cornell, for the uh, kind introduction. And thank you to everyone else, uh, Richard and Jacob and Travis and all of the people who were involved in organizing my visit. This is just great. It's already been a lot of fun. And obviously, this is the highlights. I've been looking forward to, uh, to uh, talking with all of you folks uh, since I got here, here yesterday. Um, so as Cornell mentioned, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, uh, what structures political beliefs with focus particularly on, on ideology and the nature of ideology in American politics. Um, so the plan here is that I'm going to talk about uh, broadly this question of what is ideology, the concept of ideology to get started. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about my own uh, research on uh, ideological norm conformity that I published with uh, uh, Mark Pickup and Eric Kimbrough, um, and I should mention actually, I meant to say this at the start, that uh, while this is published research, it's part of a larger project. Uh, we're planning to send out a second paper on, on um, norms uh, regarding racism uh, soon, and then it's going to be part of a larger book project on norms and politics more generally, uh, is the plan at least, uh, a little bit farther down the road. Uh, so uh, I'm still really interested in getting feedback. On, on our research, um, and especially anything that you have, like kind of ideas for, for larger things that we should tackle. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my research, and then I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the implications that we think, at least, our research has for politics in uh, 2022, American politics in 2022. All right, so to start off with, I like to ask my students, and I'm not going to ask you folks, uh, uh, since you're not my students, um, <laughs> but uh, what is ideology, right? What comes to mind when I ask you what ideology actually is? And inevitably, uh, people say something like, oh, it's, it's where I place myself on that scale that I see on the internet, right? Like, I, my ideology is a seven, or my ideology is a two on that 10-point scale that runs from liberal or to liberal to conservative and has moderate in the middle, something, something like that, right? They imagine ideology is this unidimensional spectrum that runs from liberal to conservative. Um, and that's perfectly fine. It's a perfectly reasonable thing to imagine, but it's worth reminding people that this is not actually ideology. This is a measure of ideology, and it says something about the concept of ideology that we're so likely to mix it up with our measure. Right? Ideology, at the end of the day, is a social construct. Right? It's an idea that exists in our minds, um, and it's a particularly interesting one because from the very beginning, it has been controversial, and people have never really been able to agree on what constitutes ideology, how we should define this, and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing for citizens to be ideological. This has been a long-standing debate uh, across the literatures. Um, so it helps to go back and to really reinforce this idea of what ideology is, uh, the idea that it is a social construct and, and one that's debated, to go back to the founder of ideology, the person who coined the term, which is uh, Claude Destute de Tracy, uh, who is this revolutionary uh, era French philosopher uh, who is, you know, observing the natural sciences, and this was a common thing to do at the time, even though it seems odd to us perhaps, looking at the natural sciences and, and the progress that had been made by people like Isaac Newton within the last hundred years before him, and saying, wow, if 
people like Newton can unlock the mysteries of the natural world by simply thinking and theorizing really hard about things, then why can't we do that in every part of our lives, right? Why can't we just think really hard about the best way to organize society and deduce these truths about society and about politics and about how to structure a government just like uh, uh, just like Newton and others are doing in the natural sciences. So why not create an ideaology? Literally, that's where the term comes from. A science of ideas, where we can deduce truths about how to structure society and governments. Well, if you've never heard of de Tracy until now, that is probably not a coincidence. He is not one of the big names in philosophy. Um, he is you know, remembered for the term that he created, ideology, um, which obviously is, is no small feat. If I can rem be remembered in my career for one small term, that's not such a bad thing uh, to be remembered for. But it's, it's a little bit ironic that while the term has caught on and structures so much of our thinking about politics, right? It's, it's the terminology we use to talk about politics all over the world, but we never actually had a clear definition of what it is or a normative understanding of whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, which is kind of weird and problematic if you think about it. So I think this is a really interesting topic and one of the most interesting topics to me in, in all of politics because it's so central and yet so poorly understood. And, and there's this history, right, of this concept where de Tracy originates the concept, but then, and, and he thinks of it obviously as a very positive thing, right? The solution to all our problems, perhaps. The, the physics, uh, you know, of politics, essentially. Um, but over time, because de Tracy's actual theory of ideology doesn't really take off, just the, the term, it actually becomes more famous, partly because it's kind of poked fun at by a lot of different people. Napoleon and Marx and all these people. Um, sort of ridicule this idea and, and ideology becomes associated with this notion of dogmatism over time. This notion that, uh, it, it, this idea of closed-minded thinking, right? It's, it's not accepting evidence, it's believing I have discovered the truth and therefore there is no room for compromise. Compromise, if I have the truth, would be moral compromise. It would be compromising my principles. And that's, that's not something I want to do, right? If you're thinking about things through a dogmatic point of view. So from this point of view, it becomes the opposite of pragmatism, right? To be pragmatic is to be open-minded, open to new evidence, ready to update your priors when new experiences arrive, when new facts arrive, and, and realizing you may not have had the truth all along if that could ever be discovered in the first place. So ideology takes this, this more negative term, um, and particularly uh, in the early 20th century is really when usage takes off, right? Again, we think of ideology as like, this fundamental thing in politics that must have existed since the beginning of time. But it's a term that someone coined uh, in the early 19th century, uh, or late 18th century, I guess. Um, and, and it's, uh, in, 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 in it's, it's uh, a social construct, right? Um, so the, the key is that over time, um, its meaning changes, right? that uh, early on in the 20th century, when we have communist revolutions happening, when we have world wars breaking out and civil wars breaking out between fascists and communists, people think of this as associated with dogmatism. But then later in the, in the mid 20th century, when survey research takes off, people like Philip Converse, uh, who is a really famous scholar, if you haven't read him, um, perhaps wrote what was maybe the most famous article in the history of public opinion research, actually I guess a, a book chapter, um, on, on the, uh, belief systems in, in, political, in politics. So what he said was, okay, wait, now that we have this data available to us, right, now that we can run surveys, you know, we as political science professors and journalists and politicians, we use the, this ideological terminology and we understand it to mean certain things, um, but how is it understood in the public? And maybe, rather than thinking of it as this bad thing, maybe ideology isn't so bad. Really, at the end of the day, we want to have belief systems, right? We want voters to have some foundation on which to form their opinions. So having some sort of stable belief system, something to guide opinion formations, well, isn't that the foundation on which democracy is built? Don't we need this in American politics? So he said, well, why don't we look at the survey data and see what it says? And sure enough, what he looked at, what he found was that in these surveys that were conducted in the 1950s, 
people didn't really use, average Americans didn't really use ideological terms to describe how they thought about politics. In fact, when they used them, they didn't really seem to understand them very well. Or if they were asked about them, they didn't really seem to understand them very well. Uh, he also looked at the correlations between their issue positions to see if people took consistently conservative or consistently liberal issue positions. So maybe they don't know what the terms mean, but that doesn't mean they can't organize their opinions, right? Well, turns out they don't really, at the time at least, they didn't organize their opinions consistently in a consistent liberal or consistent conservative direction. So this seems concerning as well. It seemed to be evidence that people really didn't have coherent belief systems. And he said, well, if people don't have these coherent belief systems and elites, you know, politicians and journalists and people are using these terms, the public must just not understand what's going on. They must just not know what goes with what. It was his terminology. Um, if they did, they would have belief systems that are to use this terminology again, constrained by ideology. In other words, ideology directs you to take certain positions, right? That's the idea, that you're going to reason through, and if you understand what goes with what, you will realize that you should be taking liberal positions or you should be taking conservative positions based on your overall belief system, right? So if you know what goes with what, your, your policy positions will be constrained by ideology. But he finds that this isn't the case. And he says, wow, this is, this is potentially concerning. This might mean the foundation that democracy is supposed to be built on, it might not be there. It might be that people's opinions are just blowing in the wind, exactly in the way that a lot of people, like the founding fathers and people early on, were concerned about, right? That, that people are just gonna be easily swayed. So the last thing he did was he said, well, let me look over time and see if people hold stable opinions over time. So he looked over time, and sure enough, people's opinions were bouncing all around and it did not look like they were stable or, co or coherent. And he said, aha, this is the evidence, right? People don't have coherent belief systems. And as a result, they have no foundation on which to form stable opinions. So this, as you can imagine, in the early 1960s was an earthquake of a finding, right? This is huge. Survey research has just come on the scenes and all of a sudden, here comes Phil Converse saying, hey, by the way, all the things you thought about democracy that worked, the basics of democratic folk theory, none of that really works, right? People don't really have any stable foundation to build their beliefs, and therefore there is no foundation on which to build democracy. So a lot of people said, wait a minute, wait a minute, this can't be true. Democracy is working pretty well. You have to have something wrong. So all these people came along and they started challenging him on his empirics and saying, you know, you must have something wrong, right? You've modeled this incorrectly. But time and time again, over the decades, his results have been verified over and over again. And it looks like, you know, even though a lot of people call themselves liberals and conservatives today, even, they still often lack ideologically consistent belief systems. Interestingly, however, so his, his empirical results still hold up, but, and even though they've been challenged over and over again. But what ironically has hardly ever been challenged, at least in this literature, is this notion of what ideology is. This idea that ideology isn't dogmatism, that ideology should be thought of something like sophistication, right? That it's, it's this foundation on which we build our belief systems. It means you're sophisticated enough to be a good citizen, to do what you need to do, uh, to fulfill your role in democracy, right? People have just implicitly accepted this idea and challenged him on the empirics. So what my co-authors and I wanna do is take a step back, right? And get back to the basics and say, okay, you know, decades and decades of research have gone on where people have been challenging Converse and finding that he's right, but they've, they've been challenging him on empirical grounds. Are we sure that ideology is really this thing that helps us in democracy? Are we sure it's this desirable thing? Or did maybe the people who were associating ideology with dogmatism have at least somewhat of a point to make? Maybe it's something that we should at least consider in American politics. And we, we do this partly, as we'll talk about, because we were seeing some things happening that seemed like maybe uh, we should, re we should uh, revisit this question. 
but also because we have the benefit of hindsight that, that Converse didn't, right? Converse was building on cutting edge social research at the time and thinking about ideologies as the product of reason and belief systems bound together by, by to some degree, logic, right? Um, but, but certainly by reason. That the idea is that people should be reasoning through and deducing where they stand and not thinking a whole lot about ideology as an identity. Well, we know today that about 75% of Americans can place themselves on that ideology scale. So even if you don't have a coherent belief system, many people call themselves a liberal or conservative. And we know now from, from modern psychological research that identities really matter. Identities are an important predictor of behavior and they help us because they help us to understand who we are, right? When you ask someone, tell me about yourself, right? Who are you? Oftentimes what people will say is they'll talk about maybe their job or their family, but oftentimes, especially if they're engaged in politics, they might say, I'm a liberal, I'm a conservative, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, right? They'll give you political identities as part of who they are. And, and this signals that they care about these things, right? That it's something that, that they find, that they're proud of, right? Oftentimes, or, or oftentimes, you know, as a political scientist, if I'm talking to someone, they'll, they'll often want to tell me about, you know, their political beliefs, and they'll say, well, I'm not, I'm not so much a Democrat, but I am liberal, or I'm not so much a Republican, but I'm a conservative, right? So they see parties as being these kind of blind loyalties, but ideologies are like, that's something, that means I'm sophisticated, right, if I have an ideology. So they're proud of these things. And part of what makes people proud of these identities, we know, is norms, right? The fact that these ideologies are exclusive, that they have boundaries, right? So the way the way to think about this is, you know, if you know you, you know, you have a, a party to to watch, you know, the Cougars football game, right? And everybody's there, they're all dressed in all their Cougars gear, and somebody comes over with, you know, dressed, their, you know, a, a fellow student who comes over in all Huskies gear, right? You might not love that, right? They have violated a norm, right? You hopefully will be nice to them, but it's kind of obvious you don't show up to the Cougars game decked out in Huskies, uh, Husky, Huskies paraphernalia, right? Because the norm is to support your team, right? That's what you do. There are certain rules that govern behavior in society and particularly within groups. And if you violate those rules, people are likely to say, hey, wait a minute, you're not a real Cougars fan. You can't be a real Cougars fan and come to the game dressed in Huskies gear, right? That doesn't, that doesn't work. That doesn't make sense. Um, ideology functions the same way, right? There are certain rules that go along with being, with calling yourself a liberal or a conservative, right? So if you violate those rules and you call yourself a liberal and then take conservative poly posi policy positions, or if you're a conservative and you take liberal policy positions, Someone is likely going to say, you're not a real conservative, you're a rhino, right? <laughs> or you're a dino, that's less used, but I've heard it. Um, you're a Republican in name only, you're not a real conservative. Um, uh, so so that's, that's the idea here, right? That, the, that maybe there's something to be gained by thinking about ideology through the lens of identity and, and social norms. And the implication here we think is pretty important because the implication is that if ideological constraint, in other words, this idea of what goes with what, this notion of what it means to be a liberal and what it means to be a conservative, is not the product of logic and principles and reasoning, but instead the product of norm conformity. In other words, rather than reasoning to my policy positions logically, I'm saying, oh, I call myself a liberal or I call myself a conservative, so I guess I better take these positions. Well, that means that ideological constraint, this thing that Converse is yearning for and political science has been searching for for decades, saying we've lost the foundation for our democracy, maybe we have the whole story backwards. Maybe ideological constraint is the product of norm conformity. And what it means when people are conforming to these ideological norms is that elites are telling me what to believe, and I'm saying, all right, I guess I'll believe it, right? Um, so, so we think this has potentially pretty big implications that we wanted to investigate. So, research, getting into our research design. Um, and again, I want to re reiterate, uh, this is research that was conducted uh, with uh, Eric Kimbrough and Mark Pickup. They're my brilliant co-authors. <coughs> I want to make sure that I give them plenty of credit here. Um, so what we did was we, uh, we started with a YouGov sample, 
right? So we, we surveyed liberals and conservatives from all over the country. Um, it's a, about as nationally representative as you can get at this point. It's hard to get a nation, truly nationally representative survey uh, in, in this day and age. Uh, but YouGov does a pretty good job of it. Uh, so we have a pretty strong sample of just under 500 liberals and under, just under 500 conservatives. And we did two things uh, that we think are, are kind of cool, we like to think. Um, we, uh, we started off by doing kind of a traditional thing, um, by asking people about their policy preferences, right? So you see this all the time in, in surveys that, uh, you know, will ask you, place yourself on the seven point scale on issue X, right? If it's taxes, if it's healthcare, if it's abortion, whatever, right? The seven point scale, uh, where do you stand? Do you uh, support or oppose this, this uh, position? But what we do that is a little bit different than most studies is we think about this idea of social norms. And we say, okay, well, what is a social norm? A social norm is what you believe other people in your group expect of you, right? What you ought to believe as a good conservative or a good liberal, right? So if you're not a faker, if you're not a pretender, if you're not a rhino or a dino, there are things that you're supposed to believe. So the question is not just what I believe, but what do other group members think I ought to believe? Because this is going to, in, this is important because this signals the expectations that I believe other people have for me in society, right? So this is called, when you think about what people ought to believe, it's called an injunctive social norm. So, so uh, it, and, it, and it signals the expectations that I'm gonna have coming into politics, right? I'm going to expect other people to expect things from me. And therefore, if what we know about norms applies to ideology, I'm going to feel social pressure to conform to the no those norms because I want to be part of the team. I don't want people saying I'm a rhino or a dino. Right? I want to be part of the team. Additionally, what we did was we conducted a question order experiment. So it's pretty simple. Um, oh, actually, I should say, I should back up. I'm sorry, I forgot another thing that we did. Back up. Um, so because there's this concern with measuring norms, you might say, what if people just project their own preferences onto those norms? And they just say, the things that I believe, I think those are what my group believes. That's perfectly reasonable, that could happen. So what we did was we, we said, um, okay, answer this question. Tell me what other people in your group, how other people in your group are gonna answer this question, what they believe. And if you're right, if you are able to select the most common response, the modal response, we'll give you an extra $2, which is pretty big, it's like a 20% increase in their payment for taking this survey. Um, so they have an incentive to be honest, a pretty big incentive to be honest and not just project uh, their preferences onto social norms. The last thing that we did was we randomly uh, ordered these, these question batteries. So some people got the preferences questions first and other people got the, ideolo or the ideological norms questions first, right? So the idea is that if we ask the ideological norms before asking the preferences, people should be primed, right? People should have this idea fresh in their mind that, oh, if I wanna be, call myself a liberal, I've gotta take these positions that I just said liberals take. Same thing for conservatives, right? So it should be fresh in their mind and should exert pressure on their, on their opinion formation. All right, so we're gonna proceed through uh, these results with a series of three questions. So first off, since we have these ideological norms, we want to know, do ideological group identifiers agree what to, ought to go with what? In other words, do norms exist? One of the concerns uh, that we considered early on was, you know, Congress is saying people don't know what goes with what, but is there a true definition of what goes with what? Do these norms exist in society? Maybe people just don't know what goes with what because no one knows what goes with what, right? I, as a researcher, can say, if you believe in A, you ought to believe in B, but just because I think that, and that seems obvious, doesn't mean everybody thinks that. So why don't we measure these norms and see if they exist before we go about claiming people are, are ignorant of them. So do these norms exist? So if you look across this figure, hopefully, yeah, I think you can read all. So you can see, um, if you look down the y-axis, you can see all the different questions uh, or topics that we ask people about. And if you look at the dark dots versus the white dots, um, though you can see that, that's, that the dark dots are liberals and the white dots are conservatives. And you can see, um, looking across, that most of the time they're taking opposite positions. Or they're, I shouldn't say they're taking opposite positions. 
they believe they're expected to take opposite positions, right? Conservatives agree most of the time on what other conservatives believe a conservative should believe, and liberals agree on what liberals should believe most of the time. Although there's some interesting exceptions, right? Healthcare being one of them, I thought was particularly interesting, healthcare spending uh, amongst conservatives. So conservatives, oh, and I should mention the, the dotted vertical lines are the 50-50 line, right? So we define a norm as existing when over a major, or when over 50% of the group uh, agrees that that is what the group should believe, right? So anything less than 50-50, we had to make some sort of cutting line that made sense, right? So we said no one norm exists if it's below this point. So these are these issues, if it's below that point, they're going to drop out of the analysis from here on out because there is really no norm. So so an interesting uh, point is is illustrated here that, that on healthcare spending, uh, conservatives really don't agree on what conservatives should believe on an issue that you would expect them to agree on, right? So it just really goes to this idea that we shouldn't just assume these norms exist because they exist amongst the people in this room who think and live and breathe politics, right? In the rest of the country, they might not be that clear. Um, and, and you can imagine why uh, when we were conducting the survey, you know, as, as conservatives were, and this was a couple years ago, when conservatives were debating whether to, uh, what to do about the ACA, um, why there might be some, some debate going on here. Um, but over, overall, the, the conclusion here is that norms seem to exist pretty strongly on both sides. So this brings up another question. If these norms exist, and we can say that people are unconstrained by ideology, in other words, if norms exist, but people don't take positions consistent with those norms, what does that mean exactly? Phil Converse, and everyone basically who has followed him, has assumed that that means that people are not aware of what goes with what. That they're, to use this term, they're innocent about, uh, about politics, right? So this is a euphemism, it's to try to be nice. He doesn't want to use the word ignorant, but that's what he means, right? Are people ignorant about what it means to be a liberal or a conservative? Um, and people generally assume that if you don't have ideological constraint, that's what it means. But is it? Is it really? Right? If we think back to this older view of ideology where the, the, you know, there's, there's dogmatism and then on the other side there's pragmatism, maybe this is just pragmatism. Right? Maybe some people know what they're supposed to believe as a liberal or a conservative, but they say, I don't care. Like, I'm mostly liberal, but... I don't have to take every position that liberals take, or I'm mostly conservative, but I don't feel like I have to take all those positions. Maybe that's it, right? Maybe they're acting pragmatically, and that isn't such a bad thing. If that's what's driving this inconsistency, that's arguably great, right? People have their own views. Um, that's not such a bad thing. Well, so let's look, right? So in this figure, we take all of the people who reported issue positions on each issue that were inconsistent with the party norm that we had just identified, right? So we said these norms existed, we measured that, and now we see how many people took <coughs> positions themselves that did not correspond with their party norm. So the question is why, right? Did these people do this because they didn't know the party norm, or did they do this because they said, I don't care, I think for myself, I, don't, I can call myself a liberal, doesn't mean I have to agree with liberals in every policy position. Same thing with conservatives. And sure enough, what we found was, of course, as usual, Converse is right on a lot of stuff, right? Converse is a pretty smart guy for somebody, especially somebody writing back then when he had, you know, it was the early days of Serbia research. So pretty brilliant work, amazing that it stood the test of time as well, over and over and over again. But there is something more here, right? That you can see across these issues, a whole lot of pragmatism, right? About a third on average of all of the, la the, the inconsistencies people report are knowing inconsistencies. In other words, they're not doing it because they didn't know the norm. They correctly identify the norm and then take the position opposite that norm on the other side. So we thought this was, was pretty interesting and pretty heartening in a lot of ways. Um, uh, that, that people are, you know, it doesn't seem like they're necessarily being led around by the nose, that, that maybe this dogmatism thing, you know, this wasn't such a concern. Maybe, you know, Converse, in fact, anticipates this um, and has a, has a line in his chapter where he says, well, you know, people learn their ideologies from elites, but they, they make adjustments around the fringes, no doubt, right? So he's sort of anticipating this and saying, well, you know, if you're worried about elites 
manipulating people. I don't. I'm not saying that. I think people will make adjustments, but on average, I expect their their issue or their their uh, policy positions to be constrained by ideology. Um, so we're finding evidence of this. It looks like that people are pragmatic. So this is this is we think probably a good thing. But the million dollar question, of course, is what happens when we prime these norms? Do people bring their policy positions into alignment with their ideolo ideolo ideological identities when they're made aware of these norms and these are salient in their minds? So in other words, is ideological constraint the thing that we've been looking for for decades? Is this actually a product of norm conformity? And Fortunately for our research project, not so fortunately for our democracy, we find exactly this. That, and I should mention that, so all the, result, the results I've presented so far are from the unprimed side of our design because we were separating this and saving this to last, right? So now we're comparing these two sides of our design so we can compare the people who are primed versus unprimed and we can see these statistically significant and substantively pretty large movements away from pragmatism toward ideological constraint when we prime these norms, suggesting constraint is indeed the product of norm conformity, the product of thinking, oh, I better toe the line, right? I better fall in line uh, because I want to be able to keep calling myself a member of this group. So big picture, what does this all mean, right? So just to reiterate, I kind of said this already, the assumption since Converse and that most of the American politics literature is built on is this idea that citizens hold political leaders accountable. That's their job, right? That's why we're voting. And they're better equipped to do this when they have a stable belief system to build their policy positions on, right? This helps them to not just blow in the wind, right? It makes the signal we send through our votes clearer to elites, right? So our policy positions aren't just random. We're actually able to hold political leaders accountable if we have stable, clear beliefs that we're signaling through our votes, right? That's the idea. But if ideology is actually not what we've been thinking it was, it's not a product of, of reason and, and rooted in, 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 in rooted in belief in this belief system, if instead we are feeling socially pressured to take positions in order to be part of the group, this puts us in a terrible position, frankly, right? This puts us in a position to be manipulated by the very elites we're supposed to be holding accountable, right? Because presumably those elites are the people who are going to have the most influence on these norms. They are the people who are telling us, hey, this is what it means to be a conservative. This is what it means to be a liberal. So if in fact we are then conforming to those norms in order to be part of the group, it means that the direction of democratic accountability is reversed to the degree that's true, right? So that's pretty concerning. That flips the whole direction that democratic theory is supposed to, supposed to be working. So what does this mean practically, right? What does this mean? You're probably wondering, this is an election talk series. What does this mean for politics in 2022? Well, as we were doing our research, all of these things kept emerging and we were thinking, man, this is a really, these are really cool findings. This is great for our paper, but man, this is, it's kind of fitting our story too well, right? This isn't great for democracy. So I think one of the best examples of this is these 10 Republicans who voted for impeachment of Trump, right? Um, so if you didn't already know this, you know, Trump said basically, I'm gonna ruin all these people's careers. They, they're against me, so I'm against them. I'm gonna make sure they get voted out of office. And he's done a pretty good job of it, right? So you have uh, the people uh, all the way over on, I guess your left, um, who have lost, who just lost in their primaries, right? So they're, they're out of office. They're not advancing to the general election. Then we have another four who decided that they weren't gonna run. And this wasn't just because they were tired of politics. This was because they didn't think they could win their primaries, right? Um, uh, and, and, or, or at least they didn't want to put the time and energy in that they were going to have to, to try to win a primary, they most likely were going to lose. Uh, so they left, right? So they're out. That leaves two people. One of them is Washington's own Dan Newhouse, um, who likely won because of the open primary system in Washington. So he's kind of an exception. And the other one is uh, David Valdeo, 
who likely won because Kevin McCarthy has sort of protected him because he is in this very tight race and he might lose in the general election. So he might be another one who goes down. But uh, Trump hasn't attacked him very much because uh, he's been a little bit sheltered and he is in this very important uh, potential swing seat. So what does this mean for our theory, right? So, so why is this useful to us? Well, it sets up this, this almost perfect natural experiment really for us um, where we can think about how ideology works, right? Is it a stable belief system in real politics as we're experiencing it? Is conservatism, you know, holding us fast to our beliefs or, or conservatives to their beliefs? Or is, is it a product of norm conformity, right? Um, which is going on? Well, first, it's useful to think about who votes in primaries, right? Primary voters in a midterm election is usually under 20%, or around 20% lately, um, of the electorate. So it's a very small, very elite, frankly, group of voters. They are the most politically engaged, the most ideological, the most likely to be able to correctly identify what goes with what, the most likely to call themselves a liberal or a conservative, to go to rallies, to, you know, to be engaged, to be educated, right? All of these things that we would hope would make people the best citizens, the most equipped to hold government accountable, right? So it's this perfect group for us to test our theory. And now you think about what's going on, right? You have people, so not all people fit as well, all the candidates that I just showed, but Liz Cheney in particular, Tom Rice also, but Liz Cheney in particular are great examples because they're hardcore conservatives with really solid conservative voting records. Liz Cheney, of course, has her family background, a rising star in the leadership. Someone you would think that true conservatives would rally behind, right? If this is a thing, right? If this is um, what what's anchoring people's opinions and vote choices, that they would rally behind these people. On the other hand, you have Donald Trump, who uh, has been criticized for his lack of conservative credentials from the beginning, right? In fact, um, you know, of course, Ted Cruz was against him calling, you know, saying Donald Trump wasn't a real conservative. But even if you remember in 2016, the National Review, which is like the Bible of conservatism, right, is literally like where people argue modern conservative conservatism was founded on the pages of the National Review. They came out against Trump. The Weekly Standard, the neocon Bible, came out against, against Donald Trump. Since then, the Weekly Standard is out of business, and the National Review has flipped. So you can see sort of, sort of this is a really interesting situation. And of course, the primary voters went with Trump, right? They had the choice to say, who, who is the rhino here, right? Which signal should we follow? And instead of saying, I have grounded beliefs, I know what I believe, it looks like these voters that you would expect to be the most grounded flipped their definition of what it means to be a conservative because Trump was the guy in charge, right? Trump was the new person who got to dictate what the norms were and people fell in line, right? Which is the opposite <laughs> of what you would expect from a kind of a conversian view of ideology as sophistication. Uh, and, oh, and I should add that this is a, a nice natural experiment because you could argue that Trump won the primary in 2016 quite randomly, right? It wasn't necessarily that there was this big movement behind him. It was that there were 16 candidates running. And if we would have had like a survivor style primary, he may have indeed, where you vote off the least like candidate, he may literally have been the first person voted out, right? So it's not as though there was this groundswell of support for him. It's that, that the con people who were considered conservatives in 2016 couldn't coordinate around a candidate. So he won through this sort of fluky thing. So he was almost kind of randomly inserted as an, as an exogenous shock into our politics. And he has had this massive effect on what it means to be a conservative. So in summary, ooh, I went a little over, didn't mean to do that. Um, in summary, we find that ideological norms are quite clear, that pragmatism actually is fairly common. So this is a, a positive thing. But that people are, it looks like, willing to fall in line with ideological norms. That, that ideological constraint, this thing we've been looking for, appears to be a product of norm conformity. So the implication here, as I've been stressing, is that this potentially leads to a reverse of democratic accountability, where people are being manipulated by elites to take the positions that elites tell them to take, and therefore they're no longer holding those elites accountable. 
Um, and obviously, as I was just suggesting, this seems to fit all too well with what's going on in contemporary politics. So thank you all very much, uh, and I welcome your questions. So sorry, I got I get excited when I see people looking back at me and like nodding, and then I like really get into it. So I should have been about five minutes faster. Just very quickly, liberal conservative, the term strikes me as terribly problematic. Mm -hmm. And why not left right? Why not? Uh, uh, so can you talk about how and how you use those in your studies? Yeah. I, so they're they're really the. It's just that we have to make a choice. I mean, so the bad answer, I guess, is we have to make a choice about something, right? So we could replace liberal with progressive, and that's what I think a lot of people now uh, on the left would prefer. Um, but that's, again, that's a pretty elite group of people that really make that distinction, and you can see that when you ask these questions, that that reduces people's ability to understand what the scale means, um, and only really it changes their answers a little bit, right? Um, so there are lots of different ways to think about how ideology can be conceptualized, and that's sort of our point in a lot of ways, right? That, that it could be multidimensional, that there are any number of ways to define these terms. It all is just socially constructed. It's what we decide it is. So there's never going to be a right way to measure ideology. It's always going to be contested. We just have to choose the thing that is sort of the most common accepted way to do that. So we arrived on this. And I agree it's probably imperfect, uh, but to the degree that it is imperfect, um, it probably just leads people to um, fall either fall into the middle category or still, you know, progressives might say, well, I'm not really that liberal, but I see what you mean. I'm on the left. So they'll mark themselves on the left and then they still get grouped in with the group they need to be grouped in with. So we can ask them about that identity and the norms in that group. And they seem to get the idea. But fantastic question. Thanks. I'm not exactly sure how to frame this into a question, but like the example of Trump, I don't actually think seems as pessimistic as to the whole democratic ideas like you portrayed it. Like, because there wasn't a groundswell behind him, but there had to be this dissatisfaction with the current norms that allowed him to come in and recreate it. So I guess, how do we know, like, is the tail wagging the dog or is the dog wagging it? Because if there wasn't this dissatisfaction, then Trump couldn't have instituted the new norms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I want to be careful, right? I'm, you know, this yeah. is anecdotal stuff with Trump. Um, I mean, it does create this kind of nice natural experiment, but I mean, it's still, at the end of the day, it's anecdotal. Yeah. So I would lean heavily on our experimental results that suggest that at least part of the story is going, it doesn't have to all be going in the direction we find in our experiment, but there at least is this clear idea that there is pressure for norm conformity that we're finding. And in fact, I should mention, we replicated that study in another experiment uh, with two specific issue positions using different scales um, on the questions where instead of a Likert scale, where they're just placing themselves as a number, they're actually positions uh, associated with them in place in case people weren't understanding them. That replicated, the results were maybe even a little bit stronger there. So the experimental results seem to hold up. I would say in the case of, of actual politics and what's going on, again, you know, it's anecdotal, but I would say what makes it an interesting test is this, the weirdness of the primary, right? It, it wasn't as though on day one, you know, you're polling and everybody loves Trump, right? It, what happened was he started, you know, he started making gradual progress and then people started rallying behind him, right? And that always happens in primaries. Whoever is the front runner, they get lots of attention and then people start backing them. So, uh, so of course, it's not perfect, but I think that's, that's why I would argue that it's a particularly nice test because that primary was just pretty fluky, right? If it was two or three candidates, there's a very good chance Trump would not have emerged from that primary. Uh, yes, I think you were first on the right and then the left. Or, yeah, I think that's your sure, order, right? Sure. Was it? Oh. Yeah, so I, I loved in the beginning that you started to talk a little bit about political philosophy. From my understanding, it seemed very important to have a good understanding of political philo philosophy when it comes to the analytical part of politics. Mm -hmm. Do you think it would be helpful or important for some of the actual practicing politicians to study some of that political <laughs> <laughs> Oh, maybe we, I was kind of talking about this earlier when I, when I met with the grad students. I mean, in some ways, certainly I think that's true. It certainly can't hurt. I mean, I, I, that would be great. As political scientists, I wish they were really engaged with everything that we were doing. At the end of the day, we all, all only have so many hours in the day. 
So, I mean, I think there is a, a progress, a, a sort of a spectrum of how to think about these things. I don't think that necessarily everything that political scientists have to do needs to be grounded in this. These are the direct political implications. They can kind of be these big theoretical questions. And at the same time, I don't think politicians need to know all about the research we're conducting as political scientists that's really at the theoretical level. Um, so I think, if, you know, it's this chain of 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 knowledge distribution that's going on so i would argue yeah of course i would love it if people would 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 engage in this stuff um and i am a person who has kind of come around you know i'm you know i'm a quantitative political psychology kind of person and over the years i've realized that there is no one better to talk to than political philosophers political theorists to figure out the point of what we're doing and the questions we should be asking. So I think that you make a really good point, but I think there is an argument to be made that they don't, you know, they don't need to be reading Aristotle in their offices yeah. necessarily. Thank you, Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Um, so my question is about, um, so regarding norm conformity, do you think like uh, it's primarily driven by people saying, okay, so um, for example, like Trump supporters saying, uh, this is what other conservatives believe, so this is what I should believe, or is it more of a product of them identifying as like, I think of myself as a right-wing person, so I need to act in a right-wing way. And like, as a second part of that question, like, do you think there is any of that like sort of dynamic happening within the parties? Like, is there a difference between like how um, progressives uh, in the Democratic Party think of themselves versus like more moderate people? Yeah, I, I mean, I think this goes to sort of to the original question: is all of this stuff is very messy, and I think the part of what you know, I, I think we need to. This is one of the reasons why we want this to be a book project eventually. These, these sorts of messiness things are part of what we want to work out and in really making the case for norms, right? So really when you think about this stuff, all of it is socially constructed, all of it just exists in our minds, and we're all trying to coordinate around what it, all of it means, right? So all we can do at the end of the day, as much as we would like to think that we're like searching for this thing that's out there, this real reality, when we're talking about things like ideology, those, you know, there are certainly realities out there, I'm not arguing against that, but when it comes to something like ideology, you know, it's, we're all trying to, to shuffle it out, right? So I think of what is being, what's being identified here is maybe um, some pragmatism, maybe, right, that's out there. It's where people are saying, hey, look, I call myself a liberal or a left winger or a conservative or whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, just the, so, but I don't necessarily agree with everything other people in my group agree with, or I call myself a progressive, but not a liberal. So I don't necessarily agree with everything liberals say I should believe in, but we're still, there's the sense we're still on the same side, right? There's this group and there's this internal debate about what our norms should be, right? And that's really healthy. That's great. The question is whether people are willing to fight for those norms and stand up for, no, I think this is what we should believe in, or whether they say when under pressure, they say, okay, I just, I don't want to be, I don't want to be excluded from the group and then they fall in line. Right. So, uh, so I do think there are a lot of really interesting tensions out there and those have always been here, right? There's, uh, Hans Knoll has an awesome book on this, on the formation of ideologies over time, um, that I would really recommend reading. And he talks about how these, these ideas have come together into this sort of unidimensional way of thinking about things, uh, through the pages of, of the National Review and Weekly Standard and the Nation. Um, and these ideas have coalesced into these groups that we are arguing are, are now these identity groups that have norms behind them. But they all start out as intellectual debates, absolutely. Um, if I could just like add on to mm -hmm. that. Um, so would you basically say that like, um, how can I put it, like people, uh, so, um, would you say like almost pragmatism could be like almost uh, identity? Like if someone thinks of themselves as pragmatic or like contrarian or something, yeah. would that also like be able to act out in the ways I, you're talking about? I think that would be a fun follow-up study to prime people because people have all sorts of identities and things that they aspire to being, right? So, so to uh, instead of priming norm conformity, to prime pragmatism would be a great research design, right? And see if you can push people the other way by saying, um, uh, you know, don't you want to believe you're a pragmatic person? So I will say we didn't do it in this study, but in a whole different project I have with Yana Krupnikov, we did something actually very similar where we prime people to be to want to show their open mindedness. And what we find is that actually reduces motivated reasoning. So we say, like, basically, uh, you know, there's a study that was conducted at Duke University and it showed that pragmatic people do better in life. They, they make more money. They have better marriages. Everybody likes them. 
do you buy this study? And people say, oh, absolutely, of course, open-mindedness is the best thing in the world. And then we give them policy positions to evaluate, and they show that they're really open-minded all of a sudden on the policy positions. So I suspect you're probably right. Yeah. I just wonder how did you distinguish the reverse relationship, the political data of arranging their narratives based on public opinion? So, so we don't have any data on leaders. Um, we are focused on the public, in part right, because there is generally a focus on sort of, you know, the opinions of leaders, the opinions of people like us in this room, political scientists, people who follow politics really closely. And we assume that people in the public think like us oftentimes. But it turns out often they don't. So I think part of what we are trying to do with this project is flip that direction and say, let's go to the public and see what they think it means to be ideological and what goes with what. And then let's work back. And then you can conclude with the sorts of things I concluded at the end where you say, well, does this fit with what we're seeing in actual contemporary politics? But one of the things we've discussed doing is, you know, tracking like Twitter data and looking at influencers on Twitter, Twitter and seeing if that follows um, the structure of, of in the formation of ideology. Um, and Andrew Guess and, and William Schultz, his grad student at Princeton, are doing some work that's kind of similar to that, that speaks to that and is really, really cool. So, yeah. So swing voters have been a really relevant point of the past couple of elections. And with the talk about like the example of Donald Trump and this ideological constraint and conformity, how do you think the swing voters would fit into this picture? So, I mean, in some ways, swing voters are a separate thing, right? This, so I think a lot of the, the interesting action is in the primaries, right? That's why I focus on the primaries, because that's where a lot of the big battles are happening, right? There are very few swing districts left. The elections are really close, and a lot is riding on the general election next week. So, you know, we should all turn out and vote. But, uh, but there are very few contested elections left. And it's just, this is very important because you know, control is so tenuous, right? It's, it's so close to the 50-50 line, so, or, or the 60-40 the line. Um, so, the, so the key is that uh, swing voters in some ways for this story aren't as important because what's happening is, it would, the, what really matters is what's happening in the primaries, which is that people don't want to lose um, because they weren't conservative enough or, or, or liberal enough. And there was this idea, right, that one of the reasons why we're so polarized, one of the leading theories is that because primary voters are so ideological, right, the, that it, primaries become these fights for who can be the most pure conservative or pure liberal, right? And that was the argument that, that we were seeing this polarization because everybody's fighting to not get primaried and therefore everybody's a pure conservative or a pure liberal. And then all of a sudden Donald Trump came along and are people really fighting to be a pure conservative anymore? Liz Cheney looked like a pure conservative, about as pure as you can get, and she's out on the street now. So that's interesting, yeah. Would you say that the war in Ukraine uh, brought in a lot more isolation within the uh, uh, Republican Party? I asked this because uh, back in spring, Congress and Senate passed a bill sending, what was it, Billion, hundreds of billions of dollars to Ukraine while we were, while this country s still is uh, suffering financially? Like, do you think that there's a lot more isolation nowadays within the both parties? I mean, it, I think this is one of the things that's being worked out right now, right? There are people who are arguing, certainly, um, right, this is a big. So one of the things that's happening now is this this movement for national conservatism, conservatism as they're calling it. They're having these conventions and things where people are trying to um, sort of, I don't want to say construct because these things were around before. It's not like the ideas were never around, but this more nationalistic view of what it means to be a conservatism or a conservative is really growing right now. We're talking about this in the National Review now, and it's becoming this big movement since Trump came along, which looks a lot like it's coming along because it provides a rationalization to back a lot of the things that Trump is arguing for. And uh, so it's interesting to see how all these things work out. And I want, to, I want to stress, though, that the same thing happens on the left, right? That this, if this is how ideology, ideology works, this is how ideolo ideology works. We're seeing it happen, I think, I think, in real time on the right. 
But that doesn't mean it can't happen. It hasn't happened in the past on the left. That the, the question is, how do voters form their belief systems, right? And where, what structures these things? And our argument is that we all want to believe that we're rational, reasoned people, and we're very sophisticated, and everything we ever thought we derived from logic, right? And the reality is probably none of us did that. <laughs> the reality is that the social world matters a lot, and it structures how we think about politics. And if we can acknowledge that and realize that, then maybe we'll act more pragmatically, right? It's sort of like the experiment we were talking about. If we give, to, if I give this talk, afterwards you might leave this room and be more likely to say, you know what? I don't want to be a blind conformist, right? I, maybe I want to be pragmatic, and that's sort of the idea, right? That 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 we've created this this effect by ourselves by turning ideology into a synonym for sophistication. Part of the the my motivation for this whole thing is breaking that link. Right? And if we can get people to flip back and at least consider the idea that maybe ideology is better associated with dogmatism than pragmatism, then maybe people will be more likely to say, hey, I vote consistently on the right or I vote consistently on the left, but I don't feel pressure to fall in line because I want to be a pragmatist. I don't want to be a conformist. Right? So, so it's again, it's this idea that ideology is, is a social construct and therefore it is what we make of it. And we have turned it into, into sophistication in a way that I think is potentially normatively problematic. So Eric, we have time for one more question. All right, oh, yeah. Okay, uh, all right, all right, in the corner here. Hi, um, so something that's really popular among like Gen Z political wonks and like guess young political scientists is like political science tests. They're basically kind of like astrology. <laughs> I was waiting for this, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and the question is, um, you know, like, like there's so many different tests, like basically they're maybe being manufactured at a rate I can't even imagine. You know they're they're being turned out faster like than like golden age Hollywood films. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, but what can can we empirically measure ideology? Um, and if so, what skills can we use? Or is ideology too complex to be empirically measured? On? Well, I certainly think we can empirically measure it because I'm doing it, <laughs> yeah, uh, or at least ideological <laughs> norms. But but it's partly we have to think about it conceptually. I think what you're getting at is how do we conceptualize it. Um, in a way that actually makes sense, that, yeah. that sort of maps on to, uh, or that, that, that um, is going to be most useful, I guess that's the way I should say. Um, and I think these tests online are hugely ironic, right? Because what they are doing is precisely the sort of thing that I'm saying without probably knowing it, right? They're literally telling you, hey, answer a few questions that I have selected for you because I think they're the most important things to know about a person to determine what they're, whether they're a liberal or conservative or where they fall in this multidimensional space because some of them are unidimensional, some of them are two-dimensional, some of them are ten-dimensional. So I'm going to decide the questions that matter and I'm going to decide the dimensionality of ideology. And I'm going to decide that all as myself because I'm apparently all-knowing. And, and, you know, um, and therefore, and then people take these tests and they say, oh, I never knew because I thought ideology, you know, was a thing that exists in the world. And I'm looking for people to tell me what I should believe. Mm -hmm. And somebody told me what I should believe, but it's, you know, who knows who this person is who's created this website, right? So I think it's a really fascinating phenomenon. It really gets to this, this weirdness about ideology that it structures everything we talk about and everything we believe in politics, yet is totally unstructured and has never been clearly defined. <laughs> so. Okay, unfortunately, I think our time is up. Before we thank our guest, let me remind you on Thursday, in two days, we have Natasha Hill uh, coming to speak. Uh, she's the Democratic candidate for the 5th Congressional District, which encompasses Poland. Uh, her opponent is Kathy McMorris Rogers, who was here last week. So come out to that. And then next Tuesday, which is Election Day, all of you are voting, I'm sure, we have our usual election prediction panel. Uh, we have Todd Donovan from Western Washington and two WSU professors. Travis Riddout and Michael Ritter who are going to be on that panel. They're going to give you definitive predictions about who will win the elections before the vote comes in. So come to that as well. Now, uh, join me now for a really fascinating conversation with Eric Grunendahl.